Hello, this is Debbie Dashinger. Welcome to Dare to Dream. This show won the COV Award for Best Radio Podcast Show. Welp Magazine listed it as one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year. It's high-ranking self-improvement podcast on Apple Podcasts and nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards and a Webby Award. Today's show is going to feature Kirby Seed. Kirby has traveled the world, gathering, collecting crystals and artifacts. Kirby developed the Light Labyrinth and Holotrope, Holotope, in collaboration with artists from the San Francisco Exploratorium and engineers from Apple. We'll be talking about all of that and way more a little bit later. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness. They do beautiful energy work out into the world and you can join them from anywhere, including online. Go to drdanehere.com and accessconsciousness.com. I'm Debbie Dashinger, and I'm a media visibility expert, and specifically my clients are spiritual messengers. I help you write your book and take it from the idea of your book to the published version of your book. I've also got a company that guarantees your book will become an international bestseller, and I do all the heavy lifting for the author. And finally, I teach you how to be interviewed on radio and podcasts and get massive results and visibility. For those of you who are very interested in this, go to my website and sign up. I'm about to deliver a free webinar teaching you how to do this because you came here to shine your light and give your message to the world. Go to debbie-inger.com slash gift and you will find out about the webinar as soon as it rolls out. That's D-E-B-B-I, D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash gift. So yes, my guest today is Kirby Seed, the guardian of Goliath, the crystal skull. Kirby is dedicated to building relationships between the crystal mineral kingdom and the evolution of human consciousness. For over 30 years, Kirby has traveled the world gathering crystals and artifacts. He leads crystal workshops and designs tools for healing and shamanic practices. He's also the director of Ancient Technologies, a business dedicated to the advancement of resonant light, combining natural quartz crystals with colored light to create profound transcendent states of awareness. Kirby has a BA in psychology and a master certification in intuition medicine. And you can learn more at seedcrystals.com. That's spelled S-E-I-D crystals.com. And with that, I welcome the amazing Kirby to Dare to Dream. It's so great to have you. Thank you, Debbie. Good to be here. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I'll get into how we met because I think it's very kismet that we're together right now and that you're going to deliver what you're going to deliver today. But suffice it to say, so the audience knows before we share a little later, that it was your brilliance that arrested me, that we had this call uh, because I was in search of something and <laughs> It wasn't your usual crystal hall. <laughs> I found somebody on the other end, like, this is your genius. There is no doubt you were born to do this. So I want to start with the word crystal. Okay. And everybody in the audience, they get it, right? What a crystal is. Most of them have them, wear them, et cetera, use them for meditation. So crystal, it's it's kind of interesting word because it's derived from the ancient Greek, krustalos. And it means ice, and it also means rock crystal, right? The word crusos is icy, cold frost. Yes. And with that in mind, the inception of that amazing word, where did the idea of using crystals to heal and transform begin? Well, I think the ancients discovered rocks, minerals, fossils, and crystals as, um, uh, you know, they always regarded the earth as sacred, mm. life-giving. And these are rarefied forms of the earth. Mm. And they found that there was a magic to them. It was not really understood, but they created all types of, of rituals around 
crystals and minerals. And they found that they had um, properties that uh, would heal, that would uh, bring knowledge, that there were quartz crystals, for example, um, one of their uh, main attributes is they hold information and energy. And the ancients found that if they meditated with these uh, crystals, they would um, have impressions of the earth, of geology, of their own ancestry. They would have visions of, of the future. They would go into these quartz crystals and um, uh, psychically and attuned to their ancestral realms. They were, these are the memory chips of the earth and of our planet. And the ancients knew how to, how, they discovered how to tap into them through plant medicines as well. Okay. And that was, you know, one avenue. Um, and uh, and something happened, this synergy between crystals and humans. And we have been companions for the, since the beginning of time, helping each other. Um, I love that. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's beautiful. That's like talking about the evolution of wolves and how they got domesticated in ancient times and now they are our best friends. So they say our dogs, I've got three of them here. And you're talking about crystals in the same way. And I'm amazed when you talk about the fact that the ancients would sit down and have this intimacy, this download about Pachamama, about the earth, about their lineage. And and were they doing this sober or, because you did mention plant medicine, or did they have to imbibe something to get there? They, uh, I, I believe they discovered it um, just naturally through their normal consciousness and mm -hmm. through their everyday activities. Uh, they were attracted to different colors. Uh, mm -hmm. of different minerals and they created um paints they they the colors uh the colors um had different feeling states to it so red would mean something to them or blue would mean something to them and they would mm -hmm. use these as a creative process and um naturally when they were doing teacher plants uh they mm -hmm. they would be around crystals and the crystals would it would then open up a communication to with the crystal kingdom to the uh the person doing the shamanic journey and then all kinds of possibilities would open up oh. okay so that's awesome because <laughs> i know i'll be drinking ayahuasca for sure before the end of the year uh, and uh, uh i will definitely take some crystals i've always seen people who had them in their space yes. uh during the ceremony but i would enter it in a whole different way after hearing what you're sharing to open up to the possibility for that, for the crystal to also communicate with me. When you're doing the uh, um, sacred ceremony with the, the teacher plants, yes, bring your favorite crystals with you. Bring a lot of crystals with you. You never know which one is going to uh, stand up and go, oh, Debbie, it's time for us to work right now. And you will know, put that crystal on your chest, mm. on your forehead, on your body, perhaps a place where you feel like your body needs healing um if you if you it'll they'll help ground you they'll help transmute and transform the energies that you you are processing wow. they will aid you in whatever you're doing on your shamanic uh journey take your favorite crystals and see which ones what will happen is um you are uh, you, you know you have crystals and what'll what'll begin to reveal itself is some of them some of them will be your journey crystals. Some of them will be your protector crystals. Mm. Some of them will be linked to your higher self crystal if you want to talk with your higher self or a particular lineage. Um, so different crystals will reveal their different functions to you as you work with them more and more. Yes. And folks, I just want to tell you who are listening you probably enjoy this, <laughs> enjoy the audio, but you will also want to go to youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger or Spotify where the video is because both Kirby and I will be holding things up from time to time and they'll be exquisite, but also the visual is a big part of this. So join us there too. I want to show people this because this is a work of art. I got it from you and I had a love affair immediately. So 
first of all, I'm in Dr. I'll, and I'm not promoting, this is not an affiliate thing, but this was my calling. I've been called since 2019 when I did ayahuasca and they kept telling me you're a shaman, you're a healer, you're a priestess. And I'm like, what? I was really lost about that. I knew I had friends who were those things, or I interview people on my show who are those things, but I didn't feel I was at all. And it took years for this to unfold. And the shaman thing is big. I think it's old, ancient for me. So I did sign up with Dr. Violdo and I am in, in the six month program. We've got only six weeks to go, wow, because it's beautiful. And one of the first things they said in the list of all the things we had to get was a Vogel crystal. And they made it really clear the importance, you know, don't just get one, like don't go on, okay, whatever. Sorry, Amazon, but don't just go on Amazon or something like that. And just buy something like get the real deal because this is a healing tool. And you spent uh, easily 45 minutes with me on the phone once I decided to buy. And I couldn't believe the personal, in-depth, beautiful questions you asked me that you said were going to go into this crystal. And so I'd like to ask you a little bit about that. And also just so people know, because I was kind of funny, I was like, I have really tiny hands and I do have really tiny hands. I may wear big rings, but I have tiny hands. And I was so concerned to have something big and you never even met me. And how you did this is beyond me. But look at this. How perfect is this gorgeous, like perfect in my hand and uh, 13 sided. This is natural. Yes. So talk about this and why you asked the questions you did in order to create this and how this is my crystal or anybody who comes to you their crystal okay well first of all it's called a vogel crystal after marcel vogel marcel was a scientist with ibm healer teacher metaphysician a very renaissance man he had um patents on the first uh liquid crystal display screens. His last patent before he passed away was he faceted quartz, put them in tubes, and passed wine through the tubes, and it aged the wine much faster and much smoother. There are some wineries up in Northern California that still use his technology. So, it, it, you know, his claim to fame with regard to what we're doing is he discovered the correct angles to cut quartz to maximize the piezoelectric potential or the energy that is generated from the quartz. For example, um, here's a natural quartz crystal and it's all Vogel crystals are cut along the C-axis or the direction of growth. So that's very important that it's not cut this way or this way or angled, but, but it maximizes the, um, the uh, energetic growth pattern of the crystal. Mm -hmm. And so they're all cut like that. And they're very specific degrees, 52 degrees, give or take, maybe a half degree at the base. It's the um, the the um, uh, angle of the great pyramids are at. And there's some something very uh, synergistic and magical about, you know, that particular angle. The tip, there's a lot more flexibility in terms of, of the different angles to cut, depending if you're doing something more like uh, psychic surgery, very fine, fine work, high detailed work, or more broad, bigger, energetic movement this kind of thing so the 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 end tip may vary uh in terms of its angle but um it's the rolls royce of cutting crystals and it's taking the natural piezoelectric uh characteristics of the of the quartz and maximizing it in a form that um that gives that gives the best expression to that now one of the uh attributes of quartz, as I mentioned before, is it stores information and energy. It's uh, it's just holding the quartz. It will begin recording uh, its resonance with you. It'll begin blending itself with you and you it. And so what we do when we cut a, a Vogel crystal for somebody, uh, particularly a natural crystal, uh, we do laboratory grown crystals too, but um, because it's hard to find natural crystals that's flawless and it gets expensive. So not everyone can get one, but we do have natural crystal as well. And um, so what we do is we do an information gathering process from the person we're cutting the crystal for, their birth date, their uh, birthplace, their astrological sign, 
um, their lineage, if they have, if they work with different uh, of different unseen friends, maybe it's their ancestors, maybe it's a, a relative that's passed that they still work with, maybe it's uh, an ET or some someone from the future. So we gather this information. We also gather their intentions. How do you want to use this crystal? For the four winds, they have a very specific process of extraction, which is very similar to an exorcism where you're extracting energy from a person that um, basically isn't there. It's maladaptive energy and it's uh, it's uh, can be anything from very traumatic to other entities that, that leach onto you to just everyday stuff that gunk from our you know commercial society that gets stuck to you. And you clean that out by, by um, having the crystal, putting that stuff in the crystal and then releasing it. Now, in the old days, the shamans would suck the, that energy out and put it into their own bodies and, and very dramatically, you know, vomit it Expel out. Expel it, yes. Expel it, yes. And that takes a lot of wear and tear on our bodies to do that. So the crystal is a very elegant way of, of uh, initiating that process. And it's no wear and tear on your body. The crystal loves working with us. That's the thing is, is, is crystal consciousness and human consciousness is um, we're partners, we're co-creators on this planet. Without crystals, uh, we wouldn't have our, um, our uh, industrial age, we wouldn't have our information age, and they're definitely partners in the next uh, wave of the age of consciousness. So um, as, we, as we begin to allow that relationship to, to happen more than just a technological advancement. That's so. very true. It's very true because without rose quartz, there wouldn't be radio, which is where I started originally, right? And radio waves came through rose quartz, et cetera. So yeah, this is amazing. And when you talk about that, so I've done these extractions you're referring to, yes. and I love that you described it as a maladaptive energy. And when it's removed, it gets taken into the crystal and we put it back in its pouch until, and you know, it's a good thing to do pretty much after the session with the client, but this gets cleaned. So I'm, I'm just going to tell you like my paranoia, and I probably watched too many Ghostbusters movies where they sucked it into the vacuum and then, you know, the presence <laughs> is still in the vacuum. And I kind of feel that like there's this bad genie in here. And so I want to talk to you about cleaning it. And I want to also talk to you about pointing because we're taught to be very careful not to point this at us or the client once something has come inside. Yes. Can you address that? And, and like now, is it okay if I do it? And what is the, they've taught us how to clean. I want to be clear, but I'd really like to hear your version. Okay, it's very important to clean and clear crystals when you first receive them. I do something called a welcoming ceremony. So I'm holding the crystal, I'm I'm touching it, I'm I'm hum, I'm talking to it. Crystals mm -hmm. respond to vibration, they respond to touch, they respond to intention and thought, subtle and gross ways of just connecting with the crystal. So mm -hmm. it's building a relationship, it's building a conduit between you and the crystal. And then you want to clear and clean the crystal. Now, now crystal basically responds to our intention. So clearing a crystal, you create a ritual. Rit rituals are just basically a way of focusing our minds, the, taking all the chatter away and being able to focus on an intent and a thought. And, um, and in this case, the intent is to clear the crystal. So I tell people when they say, how do you clear a crystal? Well, uh, there are infinite ways to clear a crystal, but your main um, ingredient is your intention to do so. Hmm. I would go into meditation. Now, now the four winds and other people have very specific protocols on how to clear a crystal, especially for their, uh, their extraction process and that. Um, uh, but I basically tell people, go into a meditative space, connect with their crystal, and when they're in the in, in this altered state, they're their guides, their counselors, their higher self, whatever you want to call it, um, ask for <clears throat> ask for a method, a means to clear the crystal that really works for you. So you may be primarily a uh, a, a visual person, so maybe light 
is something really works for your senses in terms of extending that intention. And so you may want to work with the energy of light, the sunlight. You may want to imagine um, pearlescent white light and gold light passing through the crystal, clearing mm. it, uh, green light for, for other, other people. Um, uh, uh, I think the four ones, they do something with, with fire. Yes. So they'll use the, the, the fire, the light of fire to clear and clean the crystal as well. Um, so the other thing is to use an, at least one or more elements. If you're using water, um, you, know, you can soak it in, uh, in, a, in a bowl with purified water, maybe put other uh, like sand or, or salts or th something that mm. neutralizes energies. Um, and then you just ask for the crystal to be cleared and cleaned. Um, so there's any number of ways uh, I would go into your own meditative space and get the instructions, but it, it requires a ritualized intention and at least one element, you know, so um, wind, you could take, take the crystal and you can br brush it and blow on it like as if you're, as if you're cleaning the face of the crystal, you know, and ask intuitively, is this, is, is this enough? Mm. You could do something as simple as covering it with a, a sacred cloth mm. and asking for the crystal be, to be cleaned. And you will know when that crystal is clean and cleared, your guide, your guides will have done that. And, and uh, so there's, again, there's many ways and it's founded on intention and at least one uh, element or more. How did you come to connect with Dr. Alberto Vio though? Because you've been working with him and his shamanic students for a really long time supplying the crystals. Yes. What was that, the inception of your relationship? Oh my God, that's a good question. That has been so long. It's been over 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, I just think one of his students uh, connected us and one thing led to another. I, I remember in 2006, uh, I was having um, dinner with Alberto and Marcella. Mm -hmm. And they were telling me, you know, this is the, uh, that, the financial crisis around that time. And they said, Kirby, you know, about 600 p students a year go through my program. I would really like for them to have a Vogel tool, but not all of them can afford a really expensive, you know, $800,000, even more uh, crystal. What can we do about this? And so um, what I did was I sourced laboratory grown crystal. Now in, in laboratory grown crystal, there are different um, degrees of quality. The worst is, is basically a type of glass. And the problem with glass is the internal structure, the molecular structure of the um, silicon dioxide is amorphous. That means there's no structure to it. It's, it's like random. It's like water that has just been, you know, frozen, but there's no, and because, and because there's no piezoelectric molecular structure to it, um, it doesn't generate uh, piezoelectricity. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't have all the attributes like storing information, energy, and things like that. It needs that structure, that silicon dioxide. So there are uh, very high quality uh, laboratory grown crystals um, that I have access to as well. And we try to test the, um, the quality of the quartz. It's basically um, uh, industrial, you know, for, for electronics grade quartz. Uh, th this kind of thing, that it does have that structure to it. The difference, though, is that because quartz holds information and energy, the laboratory-grown quartz is usually not more than a few years old. So it's like a, it's like a blank slate. Um, there is positives and neg negatives to that. Uh, the natural crystal, Brazil, for example, is around 90 to 100 million years old on average. Madagascar, the fields of quartz there can be up to 200 million years old. It's very, very old quartz, and there's different qualities uh, related to that. Um, so when you get a natural piece of quartz, it's really great for um, doing all kinds of things. What, for example, like channeling or, or speaking with the unseen, because this quartz has 
uh, characteristics from the earth that give it um, that give it uh, this well this ancient knowledge of being here, and um, and it it's a it's a record keeper of of, of sorts of, of this type of thing. Whereas a brand new laboratory grown crystal, it's like handing you a hard drive without any programs in it. The positive thing about that is sometimes you don't want anything in it. You want to program the crystal yourself. And it gets programmed by just you using it, just being in proximity to you, just you having a bond, and then specifically using it or or just having it you know, near you. Um, it will be recording uh, your, you know, your frequency, your re resonance, your intentions, this kind of thing. And, um, and it won't have anything else in it. So there are, those are pros and cons for, for, for both, both ways. Uh, was this always your path? Did you know from the time you were young, I am a gem and mineral guy, and I'm going to create products and tools and facilitate individuals and sessions and groups and invent? Or is this something that just surprised you in its reveal? Well, it, it surprised me and it didn't. I uh, People ask me, you know, how did you get into this? And I, basically, my father worked for an international um, construction company. And whenever he went to South America or Saudi Arabia or Africa building, you know, on dam projects or pipelines or, you know, con constructing all kinds of structures, he would bring back to me fossils and crystals and minerals from all parts of the world. And I, as a six, eight, 10 year old child was fascinated. And I have this collection. I mean, these things come out of the earth. My God, they come out of the earth. They're just, what, what is, how does that happen? That's like, it's, how does that happen? And, and so in my late twenties, I had done a lot of jobs and I was thinking, I, I don't, I'm kind of lost. I don't know quite what to do. I loved traveling. And um, I looked at my crystal collection. I said, that's what I want to do. I want to be buy and sell crystals. And I, you know, I started doing that at, uh, in my, in my late twenties. So I kind of consider myself a late bloomer in terms of all this as well, even though I've been collecting all my life. Mm, right. Right guy, right path. One of the things you sent to me was this guidebook about the exploration of the light labyrinth. Talk about what is the light labyrinth project and how can people experience it? What is the experience? So my commitment, as you have stated before, very succinctly, is my commitment is connecting the crystal mineral kingdom with the human kingdom. And um, I'm always exploring different ways to do that. Mm. Um, in uh, the late 1990s, I met through a teacher of mine, um, Randall Fonts. He was uh, a light artist at the Exploratorium. And I became fascinated with his um, study and research uh, as an as a as a scientist and an artist with light, and I said to him, Randall, um, let me bring bring some really big crystals into your light laboratory, and let's light them up and let's see what what it does. So we we did that, and uh, for example, um, this this big skull back here. This is Goliath, thirty six pound Brazilian quartz skull. And that box is the culmination of all our research. And uh, it has um, uh, seven colored LEDs, very bright. And what we did was, uh, you know, I asked all these healers, teachers, light therapists, shamans, and artists, what do you want in a light tool? What do you want to accomplish? And we put them all in, uh, in a computer program and with a remote control, and and that's that's how uh, that evolved. Re when Randall saw a really big crystal skull and crystal um, uh, spheres that that I brought to his laboratory exploratorium, 
And when he lit it up, he said, oh my God, I finally found the object I was meant to light oh. because, because, because light needs an object mm. to reflect from. And um, when you light the crystal, you're activating the silicon dioxide. You're, you're, uh, you're allowing the viewer to go into an altered state so that they can see and relate to uh, the information that's in the crystal that's unique for them. And um, we, the light frequencies that we use are based on neural feedback patterns and color. And so when we're strobing the, uh, the, the colored frequencies into the crystal, it's activating the crystal. It's putting the viewer into first an alpha, then a, a delta, a, excuse me, theta, then a delta state of, of consciousness and even gamma as well. Um, this sort of hyper-awareness is beginning to emerge, this state of, of meditation, this altered state begins to emerge. And from from this expanded perception that's generated from the light frequencies and the colors, one can, um, one's now operating out of, out of uh, a sense of our uh, psychic intuition, you might say. And we can perceive things that we can't in normal consciousness. And the crystal then reveals itself in, to different people in different ways, whatever is relevant to them. It could be uh, it could be an unseen friend, an ancestor. It could be a vision of the future. It could be something that they want to resolve. It could be how to manifest something. Um, it could be when uh, uh, we had a Vietnam vet, he would come to my house once a month because um, he had lost his legs and he was constantly on pain medication. Mm -hmm. He said when he um, was in front of the this big crystal ball in these light frequencies, he would totally not feel any pain. Wow. And that would last for probably about an hour after a session, but he would want to come every month just to sit in front of this, uh, mm. these light frequencies and these crystals and, and feel no pain. And that was his, you know, that was his thing. So understandable. You know, I have a, a large piece of gypsum here and I actually have it on a cylinder I, I believe it's mirrored. And then there's a round piece in the very middle that emits light yes. and you can do different types. So you're really making me think. So some of them can be very slow. I'll use my fingers for those who are watching, changing lights and various colors. Then there is actually one that is more strobe light and then goes very quickly. And I like the gypsum. I would also like a crystal because of how it allows the light to go through it and sometimes is uh, fractaled and it's quite beautiful. Is it important the light frequency with what the recipients receive? Is there something to the color of light and the frequency of light that's important in this? Absolutely, every part of this is important to the mm -hmm. experience of the viewer and has an impact. Uh, color, for example, I, I would I do sessions with people and we just sit in front of crystal uh, colored light, a crystal colored light. So we go through the chakras, you know, we go through the different colors. We bathe in these colors. And by the way, um, whenever I'm tired in the middle of the afternoon, I will just bathe for five minutes in orange, orange light through the crystal. And I will feel like I had a an hour of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> right. It was, it's very warming and energizing and activating and it, it retunes and retones my nervous system somehow. Mm. Orange light does that. So um, we'll sit in front of, uh, of the crystal and I'll play different colors or different patterns. And I'll ask the, I'll, I'll ask people what, what's coming up for them. Um, so I'll give you an example. Every color has, um, let's say a light side to it and a shadow side to it. Mm. So for example, red. Um, Red is one of the most provocative colors. People sort of either love red or really have an aversion to red. People who love red say things like, I feel um, alive. I feel like I can feel my body. I feel like I, I, I feel confidence. Um, red in, in Asian uh, culture is, is lucky and fortunate mm -hmm. in, in this. Um, people who dislike red say things like, um, it's anger. 
it's blood, it's mm -hmm. violence, it's negative power. Okay. Now, red is red. So it's just, it's just um, projecting. It's whatever you attribute to it. Frequency on you. And wherever you're at, where you're at is going to be accentuated and reflected uh, from this color. Mm -hmm. Now, people who say, I feel a negativity, a fear uh, um, with red, for example, then we start playing with other colors. Maybe I'll add some blue in, maybe I'll add some purple in, just enough for them to go, oh, okay, that, that feels nice. Okay, I feel, so we're working with their energy field with color. And when they feel a sense of integration, I feel a sense of, oh, I feel fine now. Then we sort of back off on that blue, back off on that purple, maybe, mm. maybe back off on the green a little bit. If, if I've added green, I, I'll experiment with them to see how, what, what's going to give them a sense of balance and groundedness at first, and then back off on that. And slowly their relationship to red begins to transform, begins to heal. Um, now, there is sometimes story around that. I had an abusive whatever, and, you know, and I associate that with red, or I had this trauma, you know, and suddenly red simply becomes red again, and, mm. and it's okay. I've now separated energetically that whole story. I've taken the, the energy out of that story, and it's just a story now, you know, and yeah. That's one of the ways in which we we use light, you know, the light therapy uh, sessions. Okay, um, that's that's amazing. Yeah, you you basically neutralize something that was a trigger, um, and I love that because it, it just takes it occupies space for all of us wherever our triggers are, our wounds, when these things repeat in patterns or show themselves. It, it really takes us out of the present and re-injures us, right? And it's a reaction to something that in this present moment isn't actually there. So it's great you can neutralize it. And so this light labyrinth, it combines the crystals, it combines the lighting programs, and it's this journey through the color and the beauty. Sometimes it has strobing sequences, sequences that are projected. And is it uh, projected into ancient court crystals? And if so, is the ancient part important is there is that where the wisdom is that can come yeah. out for us yes and and basically all crystals in geologic time are ancient relative to our, to our existence as humans so it's all ancient and um and there's also a, a morphogenic connection between all crystals so you go into one crystal and you can teleport your consciousness into other crystals as well so um so there's this whole uh is a morphogenic field once once you once you get into the crystal crystals at, the, at that level um we're using three vectors of consciousness the consciousness of of ancient quartz crystals the consciousness of light and the con and human consciousness and we find that when we align these three things just right something happens there's there's a aha moment there's an epiphany there's it's hard to describe. It's like, oh, wow, there's an awakening. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're kind of aiming for always. And I'm always adjusting the color or the frequency or even bringing a different crystal in or trying to adjust the uh, the attitude or the way or the or try this perception or try this imagery, you know, with with the viewer to, to make this these adjustments so that we find that that point of epiphany, I, I would say, you know, it's- And your store, Seed Crystals, that's in the East Bay in San Francisco, California. Is that correct? That's right. I'm in, I'm in um, San Pablo, which is a little north of Berkeley, Oakland. Yes. And so people who are wanting to see you, your crystals have one of these experiences, would they come to your store or set something up? Yes, they would. Uh, they would call me and we would just set up an appointment. And I could connect them with crystals. I can show them the holotope and light labyrinth. It's all kinds of fun things we can do here. But this is my home. And 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 so it's kind of by appointment only. So, yeah. Okay, excellent. Good to know. And so holotope. So that's geometric artwork. And 
It's said that it allows a viewer to perceive multi dimensions, which I think is amazing. When I, I watched your video on your website, to me, it looked like sacred geometry. It's, it looked like things I've seen while drinking ayahuasca. Yes, yes. There's something very sympathetic about those psychotropic spaces and a uh, high level of complex, complex geometries. So um, in this uh, corner to, to the, I guess, to the right here is a picture of the holotope. In the other room, we have a canvas that is almost the size of the whole wall with projector screens on it. And it's comprised of two images. The first image is a mandala, which is the uh, geometry that you were mentioning. And it's called the uh, E8 Gosset Polytope. In particle physics and math, the E8 is used to describe the um, uh, potential uh, location of the elementary particles in an atom, in all atoms. So we have this eight-dimensional object that represents atomic structure as we know it. And what Randall did was he colored each of the eight dimen dimensions painstakingly different colors. And then as we are projecting colored light onto the pigments, the reflection of colored light against colored pigments give complementary colors, give rise to new colors, give rise to intensities and, and glowing. Sometimes it just neutralizes and goes dark. So we have these different dimensions popping in and out. And as the viewer looks at this image, the mind begins to comprehend multi-dimension very quickly, which is what a, a lot of uh, what you know meditation and altered states is about, going into back into that sense of a multi-dimensional state of awareness, where we come from, uh, and uh, back to le a less less of a sense of limitation. And in those states, we can um, exercise new perceptions. We can uh, uh, release things. We can program for new new possibilities. We can ask for visions. We can talk to the unseen on different levels. There's many things we can do once we're in that state. Most most meditations um, uh, traditions are really about getting there, and uh, we're just now starting to go. Well, once you're there, what do you do? You, you, <laughs> you know. So. Um, and it's an eyes open meditation, both the light labyrinth and the holotope is the eyes open meditation. And what we're doing in that sense is we're inviting the conscious waking rational mind into the dream time, into the altered state. Traditionally, lots of meditative practices is about blocking or distracting the, the, uh, the ego mind so that you can, you know, get into the subconscious and unconscious uh, levels. So we have, We've done that now. For, so there's a critical mass of people now who have matured their conscious waking rational minds to the point where now we can integrate that into the, the dream time, the subconscious and unconscious. And it's very important because the, uh, the, the um, physical mind has something very precious, even though it's the weakest in terms of capacity of, of what, it can, what it can do and comprehend. I think uh, uh, cognitive um, psychology says we can only hold seven plus or uh, seven plus or minus two bits of information, our conscious mind, at one time, uh, whereas our subconscious is huge, and, and the and then the unconscious is you know basically uh, infinite. Um, but we're but what the conscious mind has is is free will and choice. We can focus. Okay, so we bring that sense of free will and choice, which is probably our, our greatest gifts, God-given gifts, into the dream time, into the subconscious and unconscious, and do our work. And that work, basically speaking, is to, is to release negative things, trauma, heal, and, and then find a new vision, transform back into a vision of new possibilities and you know, wonderful love. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. I like that so much. That's why the healing journey is really important. Yes. And um, I've experienced a lot of what you're saying, and it's also never ending, I will say. I'm so curious while I listen to you talk, Kirby, I'm going to throw um, an unfair question at you, but here you go. Have <laughs> you drunk 
plant medicine? Have you done it yourself? And if so, what is the most profound experience you have had either with a holotope, with the light labyrinth, or with any kind of crystal? And tell us about it. Oh, okay. Uh, I've probably done a good 35, 38 years using plant medicines under uh, a shaman teacher who has who uh, passed away uh, probably about five or six years ago. So I really haven't seriously done that work since since then, but I did probably 35 years of, of that. Um, when you asked me that, the first the first thing that came up for me was um, uh, in in that context was um, using ibogaine. Oh wow, you did it! Yes. Oh, this is a good answer. Okay. Um, now I had all my crystals around me and everything. So what happened was um, I was in this room by myself with with the shaman who was holding space, and suddenly I heard this knock on the door, really boom, 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 and I go, I go, hey. Uh, Victor, there's a there's a there's somebody at the door. Would you what's going on? I thought the space was, you know, safe, you know, and it, it was like like there's the police there or something, you know, trying to get in. And then I hear the the windows start to rumble. And then I hear the glass breaking and I'm freaking out. I'm going, "Oh shit, it's, I'm in a war zone. What is going on here?" And then I call you know, my friend Victor over and he, and I said, and I, he says, what's happening? And I I tell him what's happening and he goes, oh, good. <laughs> um, um, basically, uh, what he said was, Kirby, you are experiencing, um, being, being born and the, uh, the different phases. If I don't, if you studied Stan Groff, the different, there's different phases of of the the birth um uh process and in the first phase is you're in heaven you're one with mother every, you're all your needs are taken care of everything you're happy everything's great you're in par paradise and then and then what happens is is there's um mother starts to have contractions you know there's there's a little bit of trouble in paradise but then it settles down and you know it's okay and then the third stage you're act you know, you're be actually being pushed out of the womb. And so you're going from paradise into this sense of, oh God, what did I do? I'm so, <laughs> I must be bad and wrong. I must, the negative ego forms at that point, mm -hmm. basically in dealing with the trauma of being pushed out of the womb, being rejected by mother, you feel like it's, this is over. It, this, it's it. I'm dead. I'm going into non-existence. I am being killed and mother's killing me. And what, what I do psychologically is I say, what, what did I do wrong? What's wrong with me? So I assign blame and shame to myself. So Victor was telling me that's the point where this is happening. So he said, now it's really important that I stay conscious and go through this and find out what I did, what I said. The, the thoughts, beliefs, the attitudes. Like original wound coming out of the womb? Original wound coming out of the womb. And he said, it's important to stay with it and then and then give yourself um, and, underst and understand mother loves you. Mm -hmm. You are loved. You are precious. And this is a part of birth because you are going into a new world, a new set of possibilities. And you're going to be your own being in this world. And, and this is birth. And it is an act of love. So, if you, so staying conscious and present through that trauma, you know, reframes that whole experience. And he said, this is great because we spend so much of our time and energy blocking that trauma. Tremendous amounts of energy. Our whole lives are organized around it. We have no idea how much until, until we resolve it. And then it's like, just things just get easier, you know, a lot easier. Yeah. Was it resolved because of your experience? Well, I would say, I would say yes. I absolutely um, got through it and had all kinds of insights. I had just all kinds of insights as to why this 
you know, what I said then and, and the circumstances of my life now and, and, and connecting the dots and things like that. So absolutely, absolutely. I it's absolutely. Yes. So I just want to say this, preface this so the audience can understand those who don't understand, because I'm sure some of you out there have done this, I will gain, but I, it's often used by addicts and it's one of, it's a miracle. It can be a miraculous cure for people who have, for instance, a drug addiction or an alcohol addiction that with all their best intentions, they have tried everything yes. and nothing has worked. Now, the thing about Ibogaine is that it's at least 24 to 32 hours straight through. Mamma mia. So yeah. that's the only reason why I've never done it because I've always thought, what if I want to get out? And I'm in hour six or eight. And it's like, dear God, I've got, I replicate these eight hours three more times. Like, <laughs> so it's to talk about that. Like, what is, what is that incredibly extensive period like? And I assume this really long, almost two day experience was way more than just not, I don't want to make it just, but you understand that just that experience with the rebirth, there must have been way more that occurred for you in that time frame. Yeah, usually, usually there's some big issues that get come up. And then however you deal with, maybe you take care of 30%. And then the next time you go in and another 10% or 15% until until the thing flips. But the last half of the whole journey really is about resolution. How you take how you take what just happened and integrate it. And it's important because that's when people want to come out. That's when mm -hmm. they want to go, oh, I, I, I survived. I'm going to go party now, like bring out the margaritas. No, 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 no. Stay in because those these precious moments of insight help you integrate that experience. Uh, uh, so so that's one thing. Um, um, yes, it's 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 a it's a good 20, 24 hour, and you're peaking for probably 12 hours. Whereas the other plant medicines usually are, you know, four to six hours. LSD can be eight hours, this kind of thing. Um, and, but you know, when you're in it, when you're in the middle of it, it's an eternity, <laughs> you know, whether it's, uh, <laughs> um, so uh, it's, it's definitely a marathon and there are definitely uh, techniques that the shaman uses to um, keep your, psychoactivity going and doing things like um for some reason in in the case of ibogaine uh marijuana is is very sympathetic and supportive so if you're starting to kind of like come down uh you can you can make the journey a little bit longer or keep keep that level up with a little bit of uh tincture of, of marijuana that kind of thing it's really uh, nice with that but these shamans know about all these different uh the alchemy of these different uh, plant medicines and things like that. So mm. yeah. what a story. Thank you so much for going there. Lots of stories like that with plant medicines. My main connection with the stones came from, uh, uh, I mean, I wouldn't say my main, but when I really got into what the stones are and the skulls and, and these artifacts and power objects, I could see them at many different levels during the height, heightened experiences of the plant medicines. So I totally encourage people to um to get it, who to get into the the crystals and minerals with with the plant medicines you know i i don't know the plant medicines they're they're not for the i i want to say the faint of heart you know it's a it's a it's a pretty heroic journey and um if you're going to do it because it's it's not about having nice god fairy trips and seeing you know tra trails and, and and recreational stuff it really is about um ultimately it's about ego death and 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 deconstructing the negative ego. Yeah. And, Ayahuasca yeah. means death vine. Yeah. And so yeah. it is the death of the ego. It's also the, also the death of issues you've been carrying around in this lifetime or any other that present uh, powerful, powerful stuff. And I, I'll just give you a very quick story um, because of being, and I let me just preface this like, this is like one of those medical disclaimers. It's not for everybody. So, right. I, you know, unless you're called to it, pass. But if you're called to it, you know, right? Grandmother Aya, plant medicine, whatever the plant is, taps you and goes like this. And, and it's beautiful. 
to have a calling like that. I haven't, I've drunk many, many times and that I didn't drink for a year and a half. And being in the shaman school, I literally out of nowhere felt the tap. And it said, while you're in school, I want you to come sit with me. Now, I went into this experience, this was two or three weekends ago. And I thought, oh yeah, I'm going to get all these shamanistic downloads. And that's the intention. I was so ready for that. And here's what's amazing. It actually was for a different purpose. And so I hours, Lise, you talked about a hero's journey. It was a Shiro's journey. I was getting so much information about my mother, clean, 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 clean the relationship, atone for this, do that. I mean, it was, and I kept asking it, please, I get it. I'm sorry, I'm done. <laughs> and grandmother was like, you're not hours. And I literally had a call over the shaman said, oh my God, how can I get this to resolve? And he was expressing to me, you have to somehow have it owned inside of you so that this will like an earnest pass. And you know what? I let go. I totally surrendered at that moment and said, then this will be what it'll be. I'm in it for the ride as long as the duration. Yes. And here's what's so beautiful. And I don't want to make this a bummer, but you know, here's what's beautiful. My mom's health took this huge turn a week and a half later. Mm -hmm. Nobody could have foresaw that. And she ended up in the hospital and literally on Saturday, this past Saturday got moved to hospice. My mother is dying, yes. right? And no one could have predicted this so quickly. But the moment she landed in the hospital and I started hearing things from the doctors, I went, oh my goodness. And now of course I know for sure. Thank you so much, grandmother Ayahuasca for the love and the kindness you had in preparing me in saying, I need to pull you for a few hours and just this subject, let's clean you up so you are ready. And it was telling me your mom's time is coming. Yes. And so here I went in thinking, yeah, I'm gonna get these shaman downloads. <laughs> And she was saying, I love you so much and you are fulfilling your destiny in this program. So keep going, but we got some work to do. And thank God, because I can show up in this moment so mindfully. And as the healer and the leader, I'm being prepared to be, I get to be that right now and help another human being go to the other side in a, wish, in a way I wish somebody would for me when it's my time. Oh, that's beautiful. That is so beautiful. And by releasing yourself, you've released her too, to be the being, the person on her journey. So she's not holding on to you as a daughter necessarily so much. I mean, to some degree, yes, mm -hmm. but but she's not having to. She's got permission to let go on a whole nother level she may not even be aware of, you know, so that she can have her peaceful death. And go to the next place. Yeah. Yeah. I got chills when you said that. That's really beautiful. I like that, that those identities get dropped and I get to be the, the personification of something I think is very old in me and being reawakened. This shaman, whatever this is that I'm, I'm in right now and will continue to be in. Yes. And she gets to be a, just a beautiful soul on a journey. And that's ending for this moment and gets reconnected. Yeah. I, this is a crazy question, but, and I hope I'm the first who's ever asked you. So Kirby, if you could ever have just one crystal out of all, and I know you must have a love affair with so many for so many reasons, but if I said to you, you can only have one crystal Kirby, what would it be and why? <laughs> wow. They won't hold it against you. Uh, on the one hand, there's probably a, a good hundred crystals that I could say that to about. If I just had this one, and and and, and it's it is because they are all interconnected. So they're just different interfaces for the for this field of of crystal existence that and any one of those I can tap into. So I can take something as big as Goliath or something, you know, 
something as you know small as this. And I could be happy with that. I could just be happy with it. That would be enough. So it's actually uh, one of my teachers said that's one reason why I'm, I'm actually good at in this business is because I don't necessarily fall in love with everything. I know I know people in this business that, oh, I got to have this. I got to have this. And then they end up not selling stuff because you got to let it go. I what gives me a thrill is when I when I've connected somebody with a crystal and it feels right for them. And that's that's where my that's my, where, where it's juicy for me, you know. So, um, so yes, I could literally, there's, there's probably like 20 crystals, um, Goliath being one, uh, you'd be surprised how few crystals I say are mine. You know, I really just have like 20 or 30, you know, so it's you're not unattached. I love that. Can yeah. we meet Goliath? Is that okay to take him off of yes. the stand and have him be introduced Absolutely. to us? Because I do want to talk about the crystal skulls. And while you get him, I'm just going to patter. So if I understand this correctly, there's 13 rare crystal skulls. They're in private. They're in public locations, collections. Some are like yours-ish, almost actual human size and fine detail. And then others, I'll show you the one I just got. Um, I'm like, like crazy about this. I may, may make it one of my kuyas, but this is dragon's blood and Jasper. Um, very cool. I just got him and I wanted to bring him on to honor you and Goliath and others are smaller and less refined. And I think they all originate from Mexico and Central America. And so I just want you to tell us about it. Were, were they carved tens of thousands of years ago in Mesoamerican civilization? Are they actually from an extraterrestrial race that um, has, I've heard this, a lot of wisdom and information in it? Talk about these master crystal skulls and any knowledge about them. Okay, um, I'm going to get something where I can elevate him so you can see him. Goliath. Because uh, he's so heavy. <laughs> Goliath is was big. Anyway, that's a great name for him. And so I have to say he has to be elevated if he's Goliath. Let's see. And I think Kirby even offers master crystal skull sessions. So this is for real people <laughs> setting up appointments with him. <clears throat> see. Oh, he's huge. He is huge. Yeah. So, I, I mean, there, there was a lot of, there was a lot in that question. Um, boy, where, where do I start? I, I have worked with a lot of the uh, so-called ancient crystal skulls, and there is controversy. What is an ancient crystal skull? Because all crystal itself is ancient. So then it becomes, when was the carving done? And is that ancient? And um, my friend and teacher mentor, Nick Nocerino, um, you know, taught me a lot about crystal skulls. He developed something called psychic archaeology back in the uh, 60s and 70s. Um, this was before remote viewing is, was called remote viewing. He was doing remote viewing, but he was looking for artifacts all over the world. He discovered uh, Shanara in Guerrero, Mexico, which is a, which is a, uh, um, um, uh, Sean Ra is an ancient crystal skull that he fa he found there that's that's famous in in the parlance of uh, crystal skulls now, um, and he basically said that uh, th that there are three things that primarily make a power object and particularly a crystal skull. Um, one is and probably the most important is the crystal itself. So, some crystals are teacher crystals. They're speakers. They, 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 are, they exist as ambassadors from the crystal kingdom to the mineral kingdom. Oftentimes, we call the skull consciousness um, because of the interface between the two uh, forms of life, human and, human and crystal. So, um, so we have these teacher crystals that are not only um, um, re uh, recording crystals, rec recording massive parts of information uh, from the world, even even galactically, and then and then store it that you can pop that then then you can use as an oracle to to consult and download and 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 uh, you know as a teacher 
crystal skull as a, matri as a master skull. Um, so there's the crystal itself. So to find a crystal like that is extraordinary. There's also the, the fact that, like I said before, crystals are morphogenic. So you can always use a crystal to tap into that master crystal skull as well. You know, there's there's some protocols that we you know we have, and uh, but generally that is a possibility. Um, the the next thing is the person who carved the skull. That person uh, imbibed into the carving. Uh, they they were channeling something from their own resources of higher self and unseen friends and uh, are the artistry. They they bring in the culture uh, of 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 the day and they're putting that into the carving the crystal skull and when that person is doing this in a sacred ceremonious way um that that is put into the crystal skull as well so uh not just a production carver just you know trying to survive and, and make something but but an artist and a shaman who is putting that into the carving itself. So that's second level. So one is the crystal, two is the carver. Third, and probably probably the most important is um, the person using the skull. You know, you can make an amazing power object out of a pencil. If you had enough time and energy to focus your attention long enough to make that point, the physical point in our reality, a reference for all these things that we're talking about, you know? <laughs> So uh, having said that, how the user is using this, are they, um, are they following protocols of clearing and cleaning and respecting? Are they addressing this as a companion? Are they addressing this as a teacher? As a, are they co-creating with, with this object? Wow, that's cool. And, and there are some ancient crystal skulls that there is a whole um, lineage that this crystal skull has been for many families and people and shamans mm. and handed down in generations. And, but that doesn't mean the person getting a brand new crystal skull now can't begin that process and activate that process now and make it a power object. So those three things um, have, have an influence in particular, but, but there's nothing that, that can't say that anything can't eventually be a master crystal for you, you know? So and can we see Goliath's face? Can you yes. turn him around? Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yes. So you asked about the 13 crystal skulls? Yes. yes. Uh, so there's a mythology that during Atlantinian times, the destruction of Atlantis, there were 13 crystal skulls that went out in the different directions of Earth as Atlantis was being destroyed as the receptacle for the uh, knowledge and wisdom of that culture in that age. It had galactic information. It, has, it, it had uh, uh, information from priests and priestesses. Um, all kinds of, of, of spiritual and technological information was downloaded into those crystals. And the, the mythology says that at, at a certain time, uh, uh, when we're ready to remember who we are and where we came from and where we're going and take responsibility for that, that these crystal skulls would rise and, uh, and create a, a resonant field, um, you know, back into, back into those times. And then the, the idea is like, okay, um, and we are very close to, um, highly being highly technological, being at, at points, tipping points of destroying ourselves and our environment, just like the Atlantinian uh, mythologies um, at, at that time. And our opportunity this time is to not destroy ourselves, but to go forward and integrate and elevate and ascend. Yes. So, um, so that's the mythology around the 12 crystal skulls. Uh, or 13 crystal skull. It was actually 12 skulls that had different themes. And the 13th was the master crystal skull of, of all of these. Um, whether these actually exist physically, uh, that's an interesting question. I have to say, I don't know for sure, but on the other levels, on the, uh, on the higher levels, they absolutely exist. 
in some ways, if they existed physically, it would be problematic because then who would own them and who would, you know, what are they worth? And, you know, they, it, they would, they could start a war over who owns them kind of thing. So it's kind of uh, good that we have access to, to those skulls and their information, but we don't necessarily have them in, in physicality. Um, there are a lot of people who claim that they have one of those or, you know, or not. And um, again, because of, uh, of the morph morphogenic and holographic nature of crystal, you could say I'm tapping into the master crystal skull and then thinking this is my, this is the, the that crystal skull. Maybe, maybe not, you know, but for you, that's your reality and that's what you're tapping into and God bless you for it, you know. Is there so something to the inclusions? Because it looks like he, Goliath, has a lot of inclusions in him. What, talk about what all those are. Yes, um, the inclusions, um, see, here we go. Uh, every fracture, every veil, every inclusion inside the quartz represents an event that happened during the course of growth of the quartz. So when you have really clear quartz, flawless quartz, like the Vogels, those quartz grew in environments that were very stable and peaceful. Very little happened. Hmm. Uh, but when you have inclusions, you have um, earthquakes, plate tectonic shifts, um, the, uh, the uh, um, poles shifting. You have all kinds of geologic and even potentially other, other events happening. Uh, that are recorded in these uh, inclusions. They're they're like information plates. They're like they're like little bits of memory. So when you focus in on one and you go into it in an altered state or shamanically, you will get information about that particular time and place. And and so Goliath is, is you know is 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 full of them. So these aren't aren't. Um, these aren't flaws. They are they are, they are markings of different events. They are mm. information plates, if you will. Of a fascinating lifetime. Very cool. How did Goliath come to you? How did you and Goliath connect? How did he come to be in your keep, or you and his? Yeah, uh, you know, I I found Goliath um, at the Tucson Gem and Mineral Show. I have some friends oh. who carve. And they had carved five Goliath-sized skulls. Wow. And immediately, Goliath just called to me. And um, so I had to kind of drop everything and go, uh, whatever you cost, I'm getting you, you know? And it was, um, and it's funny, because I first, I couldn't accept that, oh, I can't keep this. It's, you know, I have to sell it. I, it's not, I can't, you know, I can't afford to keep it, you know? And every time it it there was I was close to selling Goliath, it just never happened. Hmm. Just never happened. Goliath did not want to leave. And then I started working with um with I get a lot of incredible skulls, uh, incredible crystals here. Some huge crystals, crystals for the light, um, and master just absolute master teacher crystals. And Goliath has always wanted to work with them. I've Goliath has worked a lot with the Mitchell Hedges skull, with Shonara, some with Max. Uh, these are famous crystals, ancient crystal skulls, and been to many events, including with Bashar. And, and it, this is my recorded, recording witness skull. This skull wants to go to important events and, and be with, it, with um, other master crystals and crystal skulls. And, and this, so this is my touchstone back into those uh, those crystals as well. Oh, I love this. So you are definitely connected. Yes. And I love the fact that he is the major arcana. He is the one when the other crystals come through that, oh, if only we could understand most of what was going on between them and what the tutelage is and, and the assistance he's giving or the information that they exchange. I yeah. think that's mind blowing. And when you say Bashar, so I know you've worked, like you're a very humble guy, mm -hmm. but like you've done things with Stephen Halpern, the amazing musician, composer. 
Yes. Right. And I, I love him. He's been on the show. And now you're mentioning Bashar. I know you actually work with tons of transformational leaders that everybody, their names would know. What um, So Daryl Anka slash Bashar, what have you done with him? What has Goliath done with him? Well, um, um, boy, I've, I've known... <laughs> I wanted I wanted to get into the ET stuff probably about 15, 20 years ago. Cool. I really and I kept running into a lot of fear, fear mm. stuff, you know, just scary, like, oh, it's you know. Anyway, and, and I I, I was uh telling a channel friend of mine this, and she goes, Oh, why don't you check out Bashar? And I did, and I found Bashar to be positive and loving and uh and dispelling of any you know negativity or fear or any of that kind of stuff. and I just loved Bashar and uh I just got to know Daryl and April his business partner I know I know Erica his wife as well but uh April's his business partner and um and sponsored and puts on all the Bashar events and I would come to all the events and bring big crystals in the light labyrinth and they'd be next to, most of the Bashar events that you see will have big crystals next to uh, Bashar while they're channeling and on the one hand it's a beautiful you know it's a beautiful thing but it's also creating a resonance when I first um, uh, brought the light labyrinth to Daryl at his home to, to do a reading um, one of the things Bashar he came after the reading he came he came out of re the reading and he told me that Bashar uh, says that the crystal light, the crystal through the light is very sympathetic and close to, it's a primitive version of their spacecraft that, um, that there's something about crystal and light that, that their space had, had to do with their spacecraft and that it then created a sense of home for them. So he said, you know, I'd, when I channel, I'd like to have these, you know, around me because it just feel has, it makes Bashar feel a little more at home. So that's, that's what they told me. So from then on, they began having the, you know, crystals next to um, Daryl while he's channeling on most, on most of his events. Then when I brought the holotope to, um, to show Daryl and uh, in April, um, Bashar did a reading on the holotope and uh, oh it was it was amazing basically he said all it takes is 15 minutes and you can go into a deep um, deep meditative state your neural pathways that are crystallized in 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 normal consciousness become more liquid and and flexible and then he does a uh, a download he does his his uh, guided meditation and that's going into a field now a brain field where where you're more receptive so he can plant those seeds of of the workshop and then after 15 minutes you come back into normal consciousness and those seeds have been planted so um every, you know so probably for a good 15 years the holotope was at the end of all his uh workshops since COVID, though, they couldn't they couldn't do it, you know. Be, so they've been doing other things. Although um, now that we have the ability to film the holotope in you know in, in a much higher resolution, we uh, April has asked us to create a version that they can use at their at their uh, channelings at the end of the channelings now. So very, I know he's going to be in Sedona in September. Are I, you going to be there? I will probably not be there because I'm going to be there the week after that for a Crystal Skull conference. I'm speaking at a Crystal Skull conference. Oh, yeah. In Sedona? Sedona, yes. So tell people where where when. Uh if you if you it's the uh the weekend of the 17th of November, 17th, 18th, 19th, 19th. And it's uh, if you go to Portals of Ascension, oh, it'll totally. have I know them, of course. Yeah. Uh um Oh God, um, Alan St Stein, Stein the Steinfeld. Yes, Alan's yeah. been on the show. He's a buddy. Absolutely. Yes. Isn't this Neil Guar, uh, Portals of yes. Ascension? Yes. Okay, and this is in Sedona in November. Okay, awesome. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Okay, I hope is this on your website? Uh, yes, it is. Okay, mm -hmm. seedcrystals.com, S-E-I-D. 
And oh, it, so yeah. many questions. Um, so first of all, I totally resonate. I love this with your head on Goliath. That's great. <laughs> it's a great um, snapshot and meme. When you talk about the UFO, I totally get it, by the way, because I had a shift. Mine was about four, four and a half years ago. That's not a long time ago. And I went from kind of a somebody who tolerated the conversation, but kind of was an eye roller in my own head. Yeah. And that corner got turned so quickly because, you know, when the divine says it's time, it's time. And when I entered it, I started having people on the show <clears throat> that I'd seen on television and uh, like pretty big. I started with people on this show, worldwide renowned, and they channeled extraterrestrials, much as like what you're talking about, Kirby. And my questions back then, I cannot believe, but they were exactly where I was at, which was very fear-based, yeah. very fear-based about meeting them, about them landing, what would happen, all sorts of stuff, but it had to be what it was. And I think when your soul is open to that truth and that conversation, the divine is so kind. So like in your case, boom, there's Bashar and quickly you realize this is not only scary, not only not scary, but this is phenomenal information yeah. that's, very and very funny, but yeah. really deep information coming from him. And I've had so much the same experience with Daryl and with Vitika Kohlhoff and with Jamie Price and Nora Harold. And I mean, I could just go on and on these tremendous, brilliant people out there who are at least a Royal Holt, who are conduits for this massive information. And I'm very grateful. I just came back from contact in the desert, my first wow. time there. Yeah. And they had crystal skulls there and it was a beautiful weekend. So I, this is a perfect segue into, I noticed on your website, you also have alien skulls, alien heads. I guess I'd need to call them alien head skulls that you sell. Talk about what is the difference? What galaxy, if any galaxy, are they from? Tell, tell us about them. You know, the, 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 the sort of standard alien skull is really taken from the, um, the you know, the greys, you know, the, mm. you know, that, that whole, uh, you know, race. And Bashar has a, a, a very positive spin on what that whole thing is about. I, we don't need to get into it that, that here, but um, as you know, just dipping your toe into this, there's many races, many galaxies, a lot of stuff going on. To try to make sense of it is uh, mind boggling. Um, you know, and um, I just like having um, high, like I have, uh, I have um, like, oh, here's a, let's see, here's a little skull. This is, um, Chrysoprase, and it's an elongated skull. So I make a lot of variations of elongated skulls. And uh, the elongated skulls represent hybrid humans. Uh, as you probably know, we are we have alien DNA in us already. And um, the elongated skull represents represents that, that human and and uh and alien hominids are coming together and interbreeding and creating something new, a new race. Uh, and uh, a, a and, lot. And people work with those, work with these elongated alien head skulls. Yeah. And yeah. do they get some of what you've defined earlier about the downloads or the, you know, different information and wisdom? Yes, there is, there is, People who get those are more interested in the more galactic uh, type of connections uh, as well. Yes, absolutely. 100%. Yeah, they are us. Our inception was not on the earth, although we probably most of us spent many lifetimes here, but <laughs> our mul multitude of lifetimes have often been on other planets or as other life forms or energy forms, et cetera. Anyone who's read Dolores Cannon knows this or... 
has studied galactic information, especially now there's so much beautiful information or had a galactic reading um, of their soul and Akashic galactic reading. It's powerful stuff. Yes. And it really levels the playing field. You know, it's not they and them and us, it's we. Like I am that, you are this, and you may be an advanced version of me. We are getting ourselves ready for that information about who we are, where we come from, and where we're going. Absolutely. As I want you to tell the story because I love this. We we very briefly started this. You started sharing before we started the show just with me, but I want to open this up. Um, like why we're here right now. And besides the fact that I had this conversation with you, I'm like, okay, this guy is amazing. But it was our very first conversation that really arrested me. It, like in a beautiful way for somebody who shopped for crystals and this and that. But this was, my conversation with you was unlike anything I'd ever had before. Mm -hmm. So you tell from your perspective, I get the notes from class. I need to get this, this. I'm running around buying books and all sorts of stuff. And then you're on the list and I called you. Yes. Take it from there. So you called me early in the morning. I was actually still in bed, just waking up. Now, normally I wouldn't even pick up the phone, but something prompted me to <laughs> I don't I don't I didn't know you prior to this and this wasn't that long ago I, I a few months ago and I never you know never heard of you I I and uh we had started having this conversation for some reason normally I would have been groggy and stumbling over my words suddenly this clarity just hit me and I just started talk, talking to you like we had been talking today about crystals and vocal tools and how to use them and and how to download and the difference between you know natural and lab and all this all this kind of stuff and I was just surprised the clarity that my contact with you initiated oh it's it surprised me you you said I, I was very articulate and all that but but I was surprised that was coming out of me to you because that does that doesn't usually happen either so um, that's something very special. So when you asked me to um, to speak and, and be interviewed on the show, immediately I said, "Yeah, sure. Let's see where this is going." Going. So I'm so tickled that you even remembered me because I know just through Alberto's course alone, like he said, 600 students come through. I'm certainly not the only one. And then the other work you do, and um, who knows? Maybe I'm a master crystal skull in human form. <laughs> well. You've been doing this for how many years, creating space for people to express themselves and be a receptacle for that and drawing that out of them. So there was something already happening synergistically there immediately. And I, you know, and after this, I got to say, ah, oh, you're killing me, Kirby. Like, I have to figure a way to get to San Francisco and make an appointment with you because this is so beyond. And I feel like the doors you open. We all love this stuff. I mean, I'm surrounded by crystals and geodes right now, period. And we all love this stuff and we wear this stuff and we work with it as best we can. But I feel like this is such an important time. We're at the precipice, galactically, earthbound wise, mother earth wise, humanity wise, we have choices and even whether we make those choices or not, there's a lot energetically happening to us very rapidly, physically, emotionally, et cetera. And these tools you're talking about, these are portals that you're saying. These are pathways to open up. I feel what's next. And to have somebody like you as a lamp holder, that you're holding the torch, the light for us to walk on the path and gather these tools to help ourselves and to serve humanity. It feels very profound to me when you share like this. And I figure I got to get up to San Francisco and have oh. this in-person experience with you. I hope you do. And I hope you do soon. It's, it would be wonderful. Um, I, I do private sessions, but it's not my thing. I don't hang out at Shingle. Usually, I'm more of a researcher, so we we create new um, lighting effects and, and algorithms, and I want to test them. So I invite people over, and 
you know, and, uh, you know, I have a body of friends and stuff and we, and people come over and, and I get to, to, to do this. And, uh, I'm, I guess my position really is looking for people, for people to use these tools. And I would love to, um, offer them and train them for people, make them available. And, uh, that's more my place than actually doing sessions and that kind of thing. So two you know. final questions. Yes. First riffing off of what you just said. Mm -hmm. During this very interesting time of Ascension, 5D and all this stuff and galactic awareness. And you know, Bashar has said, get ready because starting 2024, this is going to be, we are going to start having, we've always had them yes. right throughout our, entire uh, human existence we've had connection with ufos and other beings however uh, with all the strangeness the government has been around disclosure and so forth that you know this is that's going away and that the real contact is going to start to begin very out in the open so in preparation for that and the ascension we're going through and all the clearing and cleaning we need to be doing so that we are the people we can our souls agree to come here to be right now. Are there, is there one crystal or a couple of crystals you might recommend or gems, whatever, that we could work with that would really help us right now? Yeah, I I would um put it into your intentional field to look for. Look for an Earth Keeper crystal, a crystal that would keep you grounded in these times of change and also keep you on point and not get buy into fear, not um, uh, buy into all kinds of speculations of whatever that to be able to tolerate the ambiguity of our times and still be grounded with an open mind. So I would call that an, a good earth keeper crystal. It may be a skull, it may be a point, it may be a sphere, um, but to find, find a crystal that you resonate with and ask, can you be my earth keeper crystal? And you'll get an answer, you know? It may be something you already have, you know? Uh, so, uh, that would be that would be my answer. Just you, just be open to looking with that intention. It will it will pop up. There will be probably ten crystals that raise their hands and go me 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 me. <laughs> Beautiful. So an Earth Keeper crystal and ask it. So you have that connection and validity. That yes, indeed, that is the one that wants to pose, not pose. That's a terrible word, but actually function. Uh, yes. For you at this time, like that. Mm -hmm. And Kirby, yes. this is Dare to Dream. What do you next dare to dream? What are your future dreams and goals? Oh, <laughs> it's, it's funny because I can barely hold on to my seat. And, and that's all I'm kind of trying to do now. There's so much going on. We've started a new website. My, my wife, Hillary, has beautifully created these two new websites and, and doing and done these videos, which, which we can share to a wider amount of people. Now um, we're just started a we're just starting a social media campaign, so we're just launching this this thing. And um, I'm personally, I would just like to see this grow. I would like to see this grow, and I would like to. Um, I just we just want to be of service and see these tools get used. Um, and uh, I it, that's really that's really it. That's that's really it. I I you know I have my parents living with me, and I love it because it completes the circle of life for me, you know. And I just I feel so fulfilled right now because of that. And and my wife Hillary's here, and we have four kitties, and all the the lives here just feel very harmonious and fulfilling for me. I, I would love to see our um, the deconstruction of our political and and economic systems 
be soft enough landing for people to make easier transitions, you know? And um, I, would I would love to see that. And I think by healing ourselves and using tools like this, and there's so many, every week you, you interview somebody who is, has something to offer in that level. And uh, I, uh, I just would like to see that continue and to reach a critical mass. It won't take that many people. It doesn't have to be everybody, but it, it just has Beautiful. to be. Thank you so much, Kirby Seed, for coming on Dare to Dream. And thank you for stepping into your mission with such a passion and such a unique way of offering this to all of us for our healing and for our path. Thank you so much for the opportunity. All right. I end today's show with this poem called Unfold Your Own Myth by Rumi. But don't be satisfied with stories, how things have gone with others. Unfold your own myth without complicated explanation so everyone will understand the passage we have opened you. Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, the weekly Dare to Dream podcast with Debbie Dashinger. Like and leave a comment. I read them all. And next week on the show is going to be the amazing Dr. Sharon Martin, who's going to be here to talk about shamanic healing techniques to overcome health challenges. Thanks for joining us today. And remember, if your message, your business, your being is ready to be seen and heard on podcasts, on radio, on media, and you would like to learn how to be an interview guest, not just get booked, we, I can teach you that, but how to be amazing once you get booked on the show and what to do after the entire system. Join me, go to debbiedashinger.com slash gift, and you can come to my free webinar. Let me teach you for an hour and give you all the information you need to go be the brilliance you came here to be. Thank you so much for joining us today on the show.